We continue now at the top of Daf Nanalaf of Nanalaf from Maseches Gitten. This is Gitten Daf 51a. And the previous summit, the Gemara was discussing the halach and the Mishnah that when it comes to Peros, you're not allowed to collect from the Chasim Meshubadim. The case over there was, let's say, a person buys a field from a seller and the seller sells it biachrayis, the field gets taken away from the buyer. So in terms of the field itself, the buyer can can get compensation even from the Chasim Meshubadim, even from property with a lien on it. But when it comes to the payros, so again, the Mishnah said he, the buyer is not allowed to get compensation from the chasim mishubadim. He can't collect from the chasim mishubadim to pay back for the payros that grew from the field. And the Gemara Machlok Asam why is it that when it comes to the payros, he can't collect from the chasim mishubadim? And Rabbi Hanina said the reason is because it's not a set amount. We don't know how, many, how much payros this field will produce. And so the Gemara asked within Rabbi Hanina, in order to collect from the Chasim Meshubadim, do you only need it to be a set amount, or do you need it to be a set amount, and also it has to be a milva vishtar, it has to be written down, and this is the continuation of that question, or again, or maybe, Kitsuvin v'yafal pi she'enam k'suvin. Maybe what Rabbi Hanina is saying is that if it's a set amount, then you can collect from the Chasim Meshubadim, even if it is not written down. Now Rashi explains over here, Kitsuvin According to that, Rabbi Hanina holds the milva al peshi ketsuva. Even if you have a milva al pe, even if it is a loan that was not in the shtar at all, but if it's a set amount tarfa mi mishabdi, Rabbi Hanina would say that you collect from the chasim meshubadim. Not all rishonim go as far as Rashi in the understanding of this gemara, but Rashi goes so far as to say that the other side of the question over here is is that maybe even by a milva al pe, as long as it's ketsuva, as long as it's a set amount, Rabbi Hanina would say that you can collect from the chasim meshubadim or not. Not, maybe we need it to be written down as well, according to Rabbi Hanina. And the Gemara continues, Tashma, come and hear the, uh, come and hear the following proof. The Itmar, because it was stated, Misha meis v'hiniach shtei bonus. Let's say somebody dies, and he leaves two daughters, v'aben, and he leaves two daughters and a son. V'kidma harishona v'natale isr nechasim. And what happens is the first one, she, she is quick to take a tenth of the property, that's for her dowry. V'lo hispiko shniya ligvos ha'cha meis ha'ben. And then the second daughter, she doesn't have a chance to take her portion of the, di- the dowry, again, one-tenth of the property, until the son dies and now the two daughters actually inherit all the property. They're all going to get way more than a tenth. So Amr Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan says, Shniya Vitrin, such a situation, that second daughter actually gives up on that one-tenth of the property. They split the property now as an inheritance, and the first daughter, she gets to keep the tenth of the property, but not the second daughter. And the Gemara continues, Amr Le Rabbi Hanina, Rabbi Hanina said to him, to Rabbi Yochanan, Gedola Mizu Amr, how can you say that the second daughter doesn't collect her dowry? We go even further than that. We say, Motzi in Parnasa, Vein Motzi in Mizonos. We say that when it comes to Parnasa, you're allowed to collect even from the Chasim Shubadim when it comes to the dowry, whereas that's not true by Mizonos. Viat Amr Shniya Vitran, you're saying that the second one in this case gives up the dowry. How can it be that she's able to collect from the Chasim Shubadim? And in this case, when it's not even the Chasim Shubadim, she doesn't collect. And in any case, the Gemara now says, relevant to our question within Rabbi Hanina, so when it comes to the dowry, we just said it's a set amount. Again, we said it's a tenth of the property. And Michtav Loksiva, and it's not written down. The Kamotzi, and it's clear over here, Motzi and Parnasa, that you're allowed to take from the Chasim Mishuban, and when it comes to the Parnasa, to the dowry. And the Gemara answers to that, Shani Parnasa, it's different by the dowry. Kevan de Isla, Kala Kaman de Chsiva Davi, because since the word goes out, it's something that everybody knows about, so it's as if it's written down. Down, and therefore, that's the equivalent of being a set amount and being written down. And Rashi explains, V'nodla Yisr Nechasim, again, the first daughter, she took a tenth of the property, Shazem Mishpat HaBonos Bishas Bagrus Onisuin, Litol Yisr Nechasim, this is the law when it comes to the daughters in terms of the dowry, Bachnosos Parnosos Nedun Yosan Levan Mashini Zona Mizonos Aros Hashah, besides for the Mizonos that they get, the support that they get, but when they reach a certain age, they're able to collect this amount as part of the dowry, V'lo Hisbika Shniya Ligvos Parnosos Hashalonis, but the second one, she didn't get married yet, so she couldn't collect that dowry. And then the son died, and now the entire inheritance fell to the two daughters. And so Rashi continues, Shniya Vitra, in this case, again, according to Rabbi Yochanan, the second one gives up her dowry. She doesn't get that tenth of the property. We don't say that first she should collect the tenth of the property that belongs to her. And then divide everything evenly. We don't say that. They just die, They just divide right now everything evenly. Because according to Rabbi Yochanan, the whole reason for giving the daughters this tenth of the property is so that they have enough in terms of getting married married, they have enough for their dowry, but here she's going to have plenty, because she's going to be inheriting half of the property. 
said to him, just because this one got first, the other one should lose out. And then again, Rabbi Hanina argued, we see even more than that when it comes to collecting the dowry. We see that even if the brother sold the property, you're allowed to take from the lakukos, you're allowed to take essentially from the chasim mishubadim. Even though when it comes to sustenance, you're not allowed to take from the chasim mishubadim. You're saying the second da- the second daughter loses out in terms of that one tenth. speak up because she didn't get it in time. Taking away the property from other people, which is certainly even greater chiddush, that lo amrushu tafsid. There she doesn't lose out. And now the property is right in front of us. She should lose out. And in any case, the point over here was alma shamin al rabichanin and ketsuvim tarfim mishabdi. Afal bishen ketsuvim kagonzu. Here you see a case where it's a set amount and you collect from the chasam mishubadim, even though it's not written down. And the Gemara in the end said again, it's different over here because the word goes out and it's considered as if it's written down. And the Gemara continues, Mesiv Rav Huna Bar Manoach. Rav Huna Bar Manoach asks the following question from the Mishnah in Ksubis. Mesu bin Osein, if they die, so then their daughters, Nizonos bin Echazu bin Echorin. They are supported from the free property. Vihi but she, it's talking about the stepdaughter, we'll see Rashi in a minute. Nizonos bin Echazu Mishubadim. She is supported, unlike the daughters, the stepdaughter is supported even from the Chazu Mishubadim. Mimnei she kabalas chob, because she's considered like a creditor. And the Gemara answers to that, Hachab Mayaskin, and here what is the case? Bishakanu Miyado. It's not simply that she's owed this this money. They actually made a Kenyan and they wrote it down. It is a situation where it was written down. And the Gemara says, Yachi, if so, Bonos Nami, by the daughters also, if they wrote it down, they should be able to collect from the Chasu Mishubadim. Again, all of this will be explained in Rashi. Bishakanu Lazu, Velokanu Lazu. The Gemara answered, they made a Kenyan for the stepdaughter. They did not make a Kenyan for the other daughters. The Gemara says, My Episcopal, well, why should that be the case? Why should we assume that a Kenyan was made for the stepdaughter and wasn't made for the other daughters? And the Gemara explains, Bas Ishto Dahavoy Bishas Kenyan, the, the daughter of his wife, the stepdaughter, she was around at the moment of the Kenyan, so Mahani La Kenyan, the Kenyan is effective. But Bito de Loavoy Bishas Kenyan, but his daughter, who's not around at the time of the Kenyan, Lo Mahani La Kenyan, the Kenyan is not going to be effective. But the Gemara still says, Milo Askinan, but aren't we also dealing possibly with a case to have a Tarvayu Bishas Kenyan, where they're all around, they're both around at the time of the Kenyan? Vehechidami, how could you have such a case to Gorsha Vahadra? He divorced her, then he remarried her. And so the Gemara gives another answer. Elabito de Vitnai Bezdin Ka'achla, his daughter who get, who gets these Mizonos through the Tnai of Bezdin, it's a condition of Bezdin that she supported. Lomahani La Kenyan, a Kenyan is not going to be effective. Basishto de la Vitnai Bezdin Ka'achla, but when it comes to the daughter of his wife, the stepdaughter, she's not receiving as part of a Tnai Bezdin. Mahani La Kenyan, so the Kenyan is effective. And the Gemara doesn't like this answer either. Vichim Migra Gara, that makes it worse. The fact that she's, that fact that you're collecting with a Tnai Bezdin means the Kenyan shouldn't work. That seems backwards. And finally, the Gemara says, Ella Bito, Bito rather, when it comes to, the, to his daughter, Kevin de Betanai Bezin Ka'achla, since she's receiving the Mizonos as part of the Tanai Bezdin, so the reason why she can't collect from the Chasu Meshubadim is because Amor Tzrari Atfasa. It's possible that he already set aside a payment. It's possible he already paid her. She already got what she needed. And therefore, she's not allowed, because of that doubt, she's not allowed to go and collect from the Chasu Meshubadim. Whereas a stepdaughter, where you don't have that concern, you don't have that doubt, she is allowed to collect even from the Chasu and Rashi explains over here what's the case. Mesu, if they die, again, ben Osein, Nizonos, then the daughters, they are supported, as we said, they get from the Chasim ben Echorin, and the stepdaughter gets from the Chasim Meshubadim. And the case is as follows. If a person marries a woman, and they make an arrangement that he's going to give Mizonos to her daughter for five years. Now he divorces her within five years, but he still owes the daughter Mizonos for the remainder of the five years. Venisa's Lacher, then she marries someone else, Upaska Imo Kimokane, and he makes the exact same arrangement of supporting her of the of supporting his uh, stepdaughter, her daughter for five years. Chayev Lazuna Chameshanim, that he's going to also be Chayev to support her for five years. So the halach is they both have to support her. One will actually give her mizonos, and one will just give her the value of the mizonos, but they both owe this money. 
Meso, now if they die, this means that both of these husbands die. So now the daughters that they're owed this mezonos, they can only collect from the, the daughters rather, not the stepdaughter, but the daughters in general who are entitled to mezonos, they can collect from free property and only free property. And that's already taught in our Mishnah. You don't collect for the mezonos of the wife or the daughter from the chasim mishubadim. Meaning the daughters, they collect as is recorded in the Mishnah only from the chasim and echorin. But she, who's the stepdaughter, she's the daughter of his wife, the point over here is to have this contrast that the person's own daughters, so they only get from the chasim but the person, the stepdaughter that he agreed to support, she even gets nizones min chasim mishubadim. She even gets from the chasim mishubadim. And the point of the Gemara to bring this is for the following reason: Alma, we see from this Mishnah, kevan dekaitzi chameshanim, since it is a set amount, she's only being supported for five years. This is a set amount. Whereas when it comes to mizonos in general, that goes on forever. Nobody knows what the amount is. Afal gav deloksiva. Now, even though this is not written down, gav yami mishabdi krevi chanina. You're collecting from the chasim. It seems like Rabbi Chanina. And it's difficult, uh, it's difficult according to Ula. So in other words, the way Rashi understands this mission is being brought as a support for Rabbi Chanina, that the fact that it's a set amount is enough, even though it's not written down, but it's a question against Ula. And the Gemara then answered, no, it's not that it's not written down over here, but Shekhanu Miyadu, they made a Kenyan in terms of owing the stepdaughter this Mizono. So Stam Kenyan, Lachsiva Omid, when you make a Kenyan, it means you make like a Kenyan Chalipin to make it a, a real obligation, and you write it down as well. And so it was written down, and so therefore it's not going to be a difficulty for Ula. But the Gemara said, Yachi, if so, Banos Nami, the daughters also, the Havale Mine, meaning the daughters that he had, not the stepdaughters, the daughters that the husbands had with the wife, Litzunu Mimishabdi, they also should collect from the chasim mishubadim. Ho'alu v'kanu miyadu kamayri. If the, we're talking over here in the Mishnah where they made a Kenyan and they wrote it down, so they wrote it down there also. If it's written down, they should collect there also from the chasim mishubadim. And the Gemara ended up answering that by the stepdaughter they, write, they wrote it down, but they didn't write it down by the daughters. And the Gemara said, my Pascha, why should you make such a distinction? My daite de Tana, what is the Tana thinking? V'chi Pascha l'mil say, de stam man de Pascha k'achi kanu miyadu l'basishto v'lo kanu l'bito. Does the Tana think that in general it always works this way, that by the step daughter, you're going to make a Kenyan, and by the daughters, you're not going to make a Kenyan. And so then the Gemara said, De lo havoi shadai and lo nolda. It's very simple. They weren't born at that time yet. There were, there were no daughters at the time they got married. That's when the obligation sets... That's when the obligation is set up, meaning when the husband marries his wife and they write the ksuba, they say that the daughters are going to be supported from the estate. You're going to give mizonos to the daughters from the estate should the husband die, but they weren't born yet, so that's why they didn't make a Kenyan. That's what the Gemar had answered, that there was no Kenyan by the daughters because the daughters weren't born yet at the time of the obligation, but the stepdaughter was around at the time they got married, and so they did make a Kenyan and they did write it down. But then the Gemar said, not necessarily. Milo askin and kolomar umilo mashmanami masnisin could go into have a bin Kenyan. The Mishnah could be talking about a, a, a case where at the time of the Kenyan, at the time of the marriage, there were daughters. How could you have daughters at the time before the marriage started? In other words, he married her. They had daughters. He divorced her. Then he remarried her. Now at the time of the marriage, those daughters are around. You could have a case like that. So maybe that also should be included in the Mishnah. So again, why do we assume that there's a Kenyan by the stepdaughter and not by the daughters? Via Hadro Paskimo Tanaim Halalo again, he remarried her and made these conditions. Damasni since Tamatanan, the Mishnah has just learned it just teaches a general case. It could be talking about a remarriage, a second marriage, or it could be talking about a, a first marriage. And so then the Gemara suggested that maybe it's different because when you have a Tanai Bezdin, like the daughters who are collecting with a Tanai Bezdin, a Kenyan is not effective. The Gemara said that doesn't make sense either. It's worse because there's a Tanai Bezdin. That doesn't make any sense. The cave went to Betanai Bezdin Ka'achla, Vuhunami, Kanu Miyado, No Sein Lev, Lahashlam Choka. And so then the Gemara said, uh, that the the ultimate answer of the Gemara was, since when it comes to the daughters, there's a Tanai Bezdin, and Rashi understands, we're still understanding that, that there was also a Kenyan, so there's a Tanai Bezdin and a Kenyan, so now he really wanted to make sure to pay, so there you have a concern that maybe he already did pay. We can say, maybe he had a bundle of money that he set aside when he died, and she was supposed to use that for the Mizonos, and so therefore by the daughters, where there may have already been money set aside for them, we don't want those daughters to collect from the Chasim and they can only collect from the chasim and echoran, but the stepdaughter, where we don't have such a concern, she can collect even from the chasim mishubadim. And the Gemara continues, Tashma, come in here the following proof. Amr Rabbi Nasan says, 
Amosai, when is this true that we say that you can't collect from the Chasim Meshubadim when it comes to the Peros, talking about the case of our Mishnah that we're discussing? Bizman Shekadam Mekho Shel Sheini Lashivcho Shel Rishon. It's only in a situation where the purchase of the second buyer came before the improvements made by the first buyer. Aval Kadam Shivcho Shel Rishon Lamecho Shel Sheini, but if the improvements of the first buyer preceded the purchase of the second buyer, then Govim in the Chasim Meshubadim. Then he can collect from the Chasim Meshubadim. And the Gemara says, Alma Mishum Delo Kadim, you see from here, from the statement of Rabbi Nassim, that it has nothing to do with Ksuvin or Ksuvin. It has to do with the fact of which buyer, which purchase came first. And Rashi over here explains... When do we say that you can't collect for the payrolls from the chasim meshubadim? Bizman shekada mekhos shalokeach sheni ze shaharishon shalokach sada hagzula ba lachs or olav. In other words, what's happening over here is this individual who bought the field. He bought it from the mocher biachrayas. And it turned out that the mocher had stolen the field. And so the field got taken away from the lokeach, and the lokeach now wants to be compensated, and he wants to collect from the chasim meshubadim. And we said that from the peros, as far as the peros that he grew on the field, he cannot collect from the chasim meshubadim. And so the, the statement of Rabbi Nassim here is saying, when do we say that he cannot collect from the chasim meshubadim? That's in a situation where the lokeach sheni, meaning to say the person who currently has possession of the fields with the lien on them, the one that the person who bought the field that was stolen is trying to collect from, that's only when that came first. Meaning that came before the improvements that were made by the first Lokayach. Meaning, at the time that the second individual purchased from this same mocher, who was a thief, that first lokeach still hadn't improved, he still hadn't grown the fruits on the stolen piece of property. So therefore, that second buyer is not responsible, and his property can't be taken away to compensate for those payrolls. Those payrolls didn't even exist at the time that he bought the property, which had the lien on it. But if that first person had already improved Prove that stolen land, and now the fruits were already there when the second buyer bought the property with a lien on it. Now it's already been improved, and everybody knows it was sold with Achrayis. So Now all the property of the Gazlan has a lien on it, even for the fruits. And you see from this, it has nothing to do with the fact that it's written down, or the fact that it's a set amount. It just has to do with, at the time the lien goes on the property, were there fruits or not. I'll you see that the real reason is because it didn't come first. It has nothing to do with the set amount or written down. It just has to do with at what point in time did the land grow these fruits. And so therefore that seems to go against both opinions that we said before, both the opinion of Ula and the opinion of Rabbi Hanina. And so the Gemara answers Tanoihi. The Gemara answers it's actually Machlokas Tanoim in terms of what the reason is that you can't collect from the Chosim Meshubadim by Peros. The Tanya, as we learned in a Brai, Sa'in Motzi and Lachil as Peros or L'Shevach Charkos, it says when it comes to Achilas Peros and Shvach Karkos and Mazon Yishev Abonos, all of those things like we said in the Mishnah, you can't collect from the Chasim Meshubadim, that's for the betterment of the world. Lafisha ain't Ksuvin, what does that mean? Because nothing was written down. You can't collect from the Chasim Meshubadim on, on something that is owed that was not written down. Amr Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yossi says, yesh bazuba. What betterment of the world is really exists in this particular line of reasoning? Ksuvin, but it's not a set amount, and therefore you see Rabbi Yossi takes into account whether or not it's a set amount, and you see it's a machlokus between the Tanoim over here, what really is the reason you can't collect from the Chasim Meshubadim. And Rashi explains, Mimnei again, the betterment of the world is since it's not written down, you shouldn't collect from Meshubadim. If you're going to say that you can collect from the Kuchos, you can collect in the Chasim Meshubadim, even by a Milva Alpen, no one's going to ever want to buy a field, they're going to be afraid it's taken away. Who knows if this person has any loans against him? And then the response was, but it's not a set amount. How can they be careful if there's no set amount for something? Even if it's written down, it doesn't help. Even without the issue of Tikkun Olam, you shouldn't be collecting from something that's not a set amount. Again, Rabbi Yossi is saying, you should only collect from the Chasim Meshubadim when it is a set amount. 
And the Gemara continues at the two dots. The Mishnah said, If somebody finds a lost object and he returns it, and it's a case of Modem and Mixas, there he doesn't swear, even though by Modem and Mixas you usually take an oath, but by a situation where you're, where you're already returning a lost object, for the betterment of the world, we don't make the person, the person swear. And the Gemara says, Amar Reb Yitzchak, says, Shnei kisen kishurin matzasali. Let's say a person says, you found two of my, my wallets, my purses that were tied together. Valo amar lo matzasi ala echem. The other person says, I only found one, I didn't find two. Like a case of modem and mixas. So nishba, so in that case, he does have to take a shvua. Shnei shvarim kishurin matzasali. But if he says, you found two oxen that were tied together. Valo amar lo haya ala echem. The other one says, there was only one. Eino nishba. Then he doesn't have to take an oath. My time, what's the reason? Shvarim minatzchi mehad. Because oxen, they sometimes will separate, whereas the keys and the wallets, the purses, they won't separate, they will stay together. So that really is a modem and mix us. So the person says, you found two oxen that were tied together. And the other one says, I did find them, and they were two of them. But I returned one of them to you. So then he does take an oath in that case. Now it is a case of modem and mix us. And this is a statement of Rabbi Yitzchak, and the Gemara says, For Rabbi Yitzchak, Leslie Hamotzi Mitzia Lo Yishavam and Neitzik and Olam. Does Rabbi Yitzchak not hold of the idea that we said that if you find a lost object, you don't have to take an oath because of Tikkun Olam? He seems to be saying you do swear over here, and we will continue with this discussion in the next video. And Daf Nun Aleph Amud Beis.